Listening to Jonesy's jukebox, KLOS. Oh, we have one song. That was Led Zeppelin. How many more times do I have to tell you? It, he didn't say, do, do I have to tell you, but it's just, how many more times? Um, we're playing all songs by people who play Gibson guitars, and so far, we're doing good. We've still got plenty more to go. And talking about Gibson, we've got uh, JC Curley. And... Um, He's the, the new CEO, president of Gibson. How are you? Doing great, man. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me in. Yeah. Thanks for coming in. You must be uh, a busy man. Yeah, it's a little busy putting the band back together, but uh, it's, it's amazing. Uh, a couple months ago, everyone, you know, you could just feel this energy, but you're wondering how to harness it and then really set it up for the success that people wanted. I mean, all the guitarists and the artists and the fans and... In the last couple of months, we've been putting a little overtime shift in there in Nashville and even here in L.A. with all of our artists, and uh, so far, so good. You did the NAM show. We did the NAM extravaganza, as we now know it. It was, uh, it was amazing. Three, three and a half months ago, uh, when I joined, the, the very first question the team asked was, hey, JC, you know, and they kind of came in a little bit nervous. And they said, hey, you know, do you think we could go back to NAM this year? Because we, we missed it last year for <clears throat> all the things we'll maybe talk about, the obstacle course that Gibson was on. And so we weren't not even there a year ago. Right. And I said, you know what? The, if if we truly think we're ready, we're not going back if we're just going to show up with a fog machine and play air guitar. If we're going to show up for real with real changes on our guitars, real attention to detail, listening to our fans and prove it to them and get a few friends to maybe play a little music to support us, we'll do it. Yeah. Ten days later, they came back and said, here's the plan. They showed me the products. <clears throat> they showed me uh, what artists wanted to get involved. And all of a sudden, we showed up at NAMM. And, and I got to tell you, it was just an amazing moment for Gibson to say, you know, not only are we there, we're back, but we're, we're proud. And more importantly for the Gibson team, they were all a foot taller by the end of NAMM. It was, it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Because it was a bit of a mess there for a while. Yeah, I call it the obstacle course, you know, and uh, and sometimes you got to get through an obstacle course and look back and say, wow, that was difficult and tough, and let's make sure that we're in better shape for the future. Yeah. So, you know, as as leaders of business and some brands, you, you can't guarantee success, but you can guarantee you can set better conditions for success, yeah. and that's what we're doing now. You know, we're going back to what we were famous for, making amazing guitars, and that's in the DNA of Gibson, whether it's Orville Gibson and in 1894 as a craftsman right through to every generation and genre and here we are today saying let's set better conditions for success for gibson you gotta keep the classic guitars classic right? yeah i see I, th I think that's what happened jonesy was that um names and words and and innovation and novelty it all kind of got put in this blender and it, people guitarists who who either really knew what they were talking about couldn't understand what it was we were we royally were doing yeah but even someone new to a guitar couldn't really said i just want one of those really cool ones from this era or the one that he played or she played and and we struggled to understand how to connect the dots so we just completely we, we literally wiped that slate clean in terms of names that if we call something a classic it's a classic we need it true to spec if it's a 50s 60s go back and and once you get it right you don't have to change it again. So we did that. And at the same time, I think it was important to note that there are some, you know, guitars who want modern features, but not novelty. And yeah. I think that's one of the things Gibson sort of stepped over that line from innovation into novelty. And when you do that, it's just a dangerous, dangerous place to be. And so we're, we brought only the sort of true innovation and those features that, that the modern guitarists wanted. So we got classic line, contemporary. It really made sense. We showed up at NAMM and presented it to the world. And everyone said, God, that just makes sense. Common sense. Common sense. Yep. It's staring you in the face. Yeah, but, but, but you have to do it. And, by the way, you need a team who are passionate and also they're experts on going back in time and recreating it. Um, I think we were mentioning just before, I was the president of Levi's, and people, you know, that's the biggest challenge was go back to what made you famous, but what's new at Levi's? It's yeah. kind of the same question I'm getting yeah. at Gibson. Like, hey, be true to who you were and what you did and how you did it. But hey, what's new, JC, at Gibson? So you gotta you gotta look at both sides of the equation and be confident about the future. Was Levi's a mess then before you you stepped in? Yeah, you know, I, it it certainly did not go through the um, near death experience of Gibson last yeah. year. But but it was you know I can be uh, be very open and the team have just done such an amazing job in the last seven years of putting 
really get, uh, putting Levi's in a position where it's it's the leading lifestyle brand again, like it was iconic, and uh, it was it was more in the commoditized denim realm. You know, six, seven, eight years ago, it was a commodity denim brand. People knew it, but it was just in the middle, the mediocre middle. And uh, and I think what happened was you know breathing life into it through authenticity and reconnecting and going back to putting Levi's vintage into play, but also bringing some modern solutions and. If you think about it, it was six or seven years ago when the headline said, you know, death to denim because of, of yoga pants. Yeah. Well, now denim's never been stronger. Authenticity, style, comfort, casualization, and Levi's is at the center of it again. Yeah. Yeah. So, so very similar playbook. But I think for Gibson, what I've found is that there's just this love of the, of the guitar and the sounds that they've created in the, in the, the sort of legacy heritage that we have to make sure we not only preserve, but we actually capture it in the guitars that we make so that everyone can continue to play those, but also push it forward a little bit. Yeah. Does, um, so you're doing a bunch more signature models? Yeah. How, many, how many signature models can one guitar player have? <laughs> yeah, That's the question. Exactly. But I think it's, uh, what's amazing is that with, with one guitar, if you think about it, it's, we're, we, we've got, and I've never, just the fact that you asked it that way, how many can one have? Well, ready for this? The name Gibson is the first signature. It was a person. Yeah. Oh, you want the Gibson Les Paul. There's another person who's bought a, put a signature on it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you add to it the, the artist's name. So um, by definition, we're stacking up a lot of combinations. But what's amazing is the... Is, and I've got a chance to work with a lot of artists recently. We talked about a few of them. And, and whether it's, you know, Billy Gibbons telling his story about Pearly Gates or whether it's watching a new artist like Jared James Nichols come in and just strip a guitar down to its core and build it back up to what he really wants. And then when he gets it and when they open that case and they plug it in, they play it, they go, man, this is what I, dream I, I dreamed about this. I never knew it could happen. So our ability, I think it's not about how many signature guitars is how many creative forces can we can we manage and contain and then and then drive forward with guitarists to actually keep creating amazing yeah. combinations of sound through one platform called Gibson yeah well we're going to play the sex pistols right oh, now here we go this is a track called new F new feelings no <laughs> feelings i should know the bleeding name of it <laughs> but this is a white lens pool and a black beauty playing uh, on this I wow. used I used to have this. Uh, I bought it for eight hundred bucks. The black, I don't. It's not a black beauty. It's a black uh, fifty. I don't know four fifty seven. Wow. I bought it down uh, uh, Shaftesbury Avenue sure. in a place called Orange at the time. Yeah. I didn't know what I was buying. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't even know. But I liked the look of it. Yeah. And it was eight hundred pounds, which was a lot of money back then. But it was one of them guitars where it's so low to the fret. They called it um, like fretless. Yeah. Even yeah. though it wasn't. Yeah. And yeah. it had P90s in it. Yeah. And that's, them two guitars are on this track right now. We're with JC Curley, the president and CEO of Gibson. And we're just playing songs from players who played Gibson today. Take it away. Oh, how awesome. <laughs> You're listening to Jonesy's Jukebox on Cal OS. That was Roxy Music, Virginia Plain, when uh, Phil Menz and Eric played his, uh, what was it, 64? Firebird? 64 Firebird. Yeah. Yeah. Then we had uh, the Sex Pistols, No Feelings, White Les Paul and a Black Les Paul. And uh, we're here with uh, JC Curley, the new president and CEO of Gibson. Do Gibson make anything else other than strings and guitars? Yeah, well, I mean, back in the day, we made some amps and, uh, and uh, sort of connected to all things sound, and we do, you know got to throw a little pick in there too but um it's it's really back to focusing on guitars right now and then and then we'll look at you know what helps shape the sound of a guitar as we as we move forward but right now it's it's really just a focus back guitars i'll tell you what we do make we got we own epiphone which is just another amazing brand the more i hear about that story and you know just the images of the beatles coming off of candlestick and holding their guitars at the last time and those yeah. are all epiphones and so you know our relationship and our you know, they're in the family and so we can work together on things but it's you know it's known as the working man's brand and uh epiphone's just got some amazing things going on and watch for that one in the future too oh uh oasis that's his yeah that's well, his guitar right? no yeah yeah yep um are you ever gonna do any so you're just I mean, you know, like all guitars, good guitars, mm -hmm. kind of 
was at a certain period, then it kind of stopped. Yep. Is there ever going to be a new kind of guitar, or is that like going to could be a disaster? Well, I, I think there has to be, but as as we spoke about a little bit, I think you got to listen and 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 kind of you know, like leverage what you've done. And, and there was that golden era in the '50s with uh, with Ted McCarty, and, and they just said, you know what, we're going to try things differently, and we're coming. And that was when you know. Imagine today when we're listening to EDM and different sounds and hip hop and rap and someone says, where's the guitar going? Well, that was probably the same kind of questions being asked in the 50s. What's the next step for guitar? Or think about coming out of the disco era, what's happened to the guitar. So I think we have a, an opportunity as a leader, but also an obligation to kind of push things forward. But, but what I've found in my experience with, with iconic brands and trying to rebuild and reimagine you, you can't do that unless you go back to the DNA and, and assure everyone that you know exactly where you came from. Yeah. And we've been obsessed with that literally for, for, I mean, obviously guitarists have been obsessed with that, but recently we've been more obsessed than ever, I think, uh, going back to historic replicas, true specs, and really, really doing what we said we would do, which is issue new classics, which are from that era. So once you do that, and I think once you, once we get all of us comfortable, not just guitarists and fans and musicians, but when we all, even guitar shops, once they get comfortable that Gibson is back to being Gibson again, you could say, what's, what's missing? What, what's another solution? What else could we try? And, you know, I don't want to look back in 10, 20, 30 years. And when I see you in a f you know, 20 years and say, Hey, guess what? You know, we, we brought it back to what it was in the fifties. Yes. What we should say is what, what did we do to move it forward as well? Yeah. But you can only do that when you have the reassurance that you understand the past. Yeah. You think you lost a lot of love in the last 10 years? I don't, you know what? I gotta tell you, I don't think we lost love. I think it was hidden. I think it was in a cave. I think it was in the basement. I think it was in different parts that maybe you couldn't see it. I think people never lost their love of Gibson. They might, they certainly didn't like what was going on at Gibson. And I say to a lot of our guitar shops, hey, you didn't like doing business with Gibson, but you never stopped loving Gibson as a brand. And, and hence the whole vintage market and the movement and the collectors. I mean, ask a collector who, who covets their, their Gibson guitars. They didn't fall out of love with it because of what some business person did or didn't do. They fell in love with it and stayed in love with it because of what was created back then. So we yeah. got to we got to reconnect that. But again, mentioning that, you know, at NAM, which is really synonymous with the industry and musicians and artists coming together, you could just f feel the love. You could really yeah. feel the love and the support. And even I got to tell you, I was really uh, the, the outreach from even some of our so-called competitors. But, you know, most guitarists have a lot of different guitars. Yeah, but sure. even they were saying, JC, you know, a strong Gibson is, is great for our industry. We need Gibson to be back on top again, and, and I'm like, perfect. Oh, okay. I'm sure you will get it back on track. Yeah, well, well, as uh, as in the words you of... You sound like you're saying the right stuff yeah. as far as bringing the classic. Yeah, and we're, 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 you know, three months ago we were saying it, but I'm going to tell you, we really did it. We showed up. We had real guitars that people could really play, really see, um, and this is this is a live exclusive. Are you ready for this? I mean, we, we didn't put a hard date on when we're going to... Um, when we're going to launch them, we just said we're coming and people are like, oh, typical. They say what's going to come and then it's late and then the prices are going to be high. We're going to launch them earlier than we said. And we've rationalized a lot of and optimized a lot of our pricing to make sure that it's not just the aspirational Gibson that's the one off signature custom. We're going to put more Gibson and more hands of guitarist uh, coming soon. Good stuff, mate. JC Curley, the new president and CEO of Gibson. We're going to visit the Duke when we come back. Gonna pick his brain a bit more. See? You're listening to Jonesy's jukebox and Carl OS. That was Joe Walsh in the city. Then you two, the fly. That was for the uh, 5K uh, band of the day. And uh, my guest is uh, JC Curley, the new president and CEO of Gibson. Why didn't Gibson ever make any amps? You know, like Fender. Well, we did. You did? Oh, yeah, back in the day. In fact, if I recall, one, you know, ba back in the 50s when Gibson was figuring it out and when they were saying, hey, how do you get someone into it? We actually sold like a, a you know, buy the guitar, get the amp and make your sound right there as it was sort of a novelty new thing to do. And then uh, right, in the um, 50s. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then we made amps throughout. And then 
it just all of a sudden, you know, attention wavered and different things happened. And, um, you know, we, we've, I've got a couple of vintage. I just picked up a few vintage amps actually a couple of weeks ago and had them delivered. And the tubes are being put in now. And, you know, we're all sort of staring at that going, man, if, if, if Gibson was synonymous with shaping sound for 125 years across generations and genres, how can we continue to help shape sound just the guitar? But what else goes with the guitar to help shape that sound? So we're having a look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't tell anyone. Okay. So you might make some, might make some amps. We would again back to what we said. We would only do it if we actually thought we could either a go back and do exactly what we did when we were at our best making them, and people loved them back then, um, or if we could bring something that would truly be a new solution to the modern player with our you know contemporary series and say, hey, here's something that maybe no one's thought of, um, or. Um, I'm really intrigued. You know, one of the one of the things that I think really sparked a lot of energy in that whole fashion world, that, and 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 where I came from from the Levi's was really getting different creators together and doing collaborations, and not just for the sake of commercial purposes, but real creativity. You know, when we got together with um, with Virgil Abloh and, and or with Off White, or one of my favorites was Diane von Furstenberg, if you remember her. And she was a, a, a famous, she did the wrap dress. She was a designer, this amazing woman. And she's iconic. And we did something with her at Levi's. And people just thought, wow, that was so special. So if we could collaborate with the few people that know how to help create sound and then put uh, something together, watch this space. Were you involved in Levi when the Sex Pistols did a billboard? It was a, we're all, at, abs, we're all actually, your models can beat up our models was the same <laughs> what, or was that era? before you well, probably before me i was probably i was probably just listening to your album and no it and, wasn't and that where, long ago it was oh, like, is that right i don't know it didn't seem that long ago no the, the, the campaign was our models beat up your models and it was a picture of us we all happened to be wearing levi's in this one love old it. photo from back in the day love it wasn't you no okay. but i'm gonna go back and look at that you should just say yeah take yeah. credit for oh, it oh yeah yeah I did. um so when, when it was bankrupt, I mean, I, when I heard Gibson was bankrupt, yep. I, I thought, wow, is this going to end? I mean, was, that, was it close to ending and not coming back? Yeah, you know, I mean, bankruptcy is a real word. It's not, yeah. some, it's not like, oh, you know, that this happened or that happened or their new product didn't quite work like they, they wanted it to. This is, it was a near-death experience. And uh, when you go into bankruptcy, the good news about bankruptcy is that it's a, it's a mechanism designed to protect the company while it figures itself out. Yeah. And so um, basically what happened, the long story short, is that, um, you know, there was ambition beyond execution yeah. and the ability and, and maybe ambition beyond what should have, could have, might have happened for an iconic brand. And when you start using words like lifestyle and you want to be more like that and less like that, and then you take on hundreds of millions of dollars of debt to actually pursue that vision, um, I don't think the notion of Gibson as a lifestyle brand was necessarily wrong. Think about it. if you're in music and you associate with guitars and you want that it's part of it's the style of your life. Okay, that's cool. But then don't maybe chase things that aren't core to that. So Gibson got into a lot of electronics and a lot of yeah. different things that and to get there, they had to pay a lot of money. And by paying a lot of money, you have to service a lot of debt and you end up stretching your priorities and you focus less on guitars and more on things that weren't core to what you did. And all of a sudden you wake up and the debt monster's at the door and you're saying, now what? And then fortunately a group saw this coming um, and they sort of looked at it and said, okay, it's not a question of, of can we save Gibson, it's we will save it, but it's gonna take this obstacle course as I was talking about. And I gotta tell you, I was part of the conversation as they were sort of thinking about new leadership and every person I met on that journey of rebuilding the band, so to speak, I was really impressed. Their intentions were good. They saw it as an iconic brand that needed to be iconic once again, but needed some leadership to do it. And I'm super impressed with what they did to get it through. But then on November 1st, it's called the emergence. We technically emerged from bankruptcy on November 1st. And I had already had about two or three months of just preparation and understanding, not only from you know, being a musician and knowing what about Gibson, but also just getting some information from these guys uh, about what could might happen and should happen. And I was really well prepared November 1st to literally plug it in and start playing. Yeah. What, were you, you going to do a bunch of stuff with acoustics too? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the Gibson acoustic is literally, that J45 is truly the workhouse, of, uh, a workhorse of, of amazing musicians. And it's, um, you know, whether it's across country music or in, I mean, if you look back in time and everyone had a, when they were knocking about, had a Gibson acoustic with them. And uh, um, we have our factory uh, in Montana. It's amazing. I've been up there a few times in Bozeman where, you know, you can balance the humidity and the dynamics and the access to wood and real craftsmen and craftswomen up there. And, and uh, we just, uh, we decided though it was challenging because um, when you're thinking about a Gibson, as you mentioned, you paid 800 quid for for a Gibson back on Shaftesbury Avenue nine, back in, the, in, in seven, uh, 19, 76 or yeah, 77 that's a lot of money that was so, a lot of moolah yeah so so someone who says hey i want to play acoustic gibson's really good you know getting up there into 1500 2000 dollars. so what we just launched at nam was we said let's make it a little more accessible for people to get access to a made in the usa gibson so we we thought about who's the next generation of acoustic players we called it the generation series and so we just launched the g45 and you can for a thousand bucks truly get a coveted gibson guitar made in the usa it sounds amazing and then that's put new energy around obviously the hummingbird and then that j200 and our and we're doing some more signature artist models with that front cover of rolling stone had uh, eric church uh fallen into the pool with his uh with his j45 it was amazing just to put energy against the acoustic market yeah. so and we're one of the, i think one of the few brands and companies that truly have a a meaningful heritage and stakeholder in both acoustic and electric. Yeah. Not to mention the whole ES range of 335s and all that comes with that. And then there's the Explorers and the Flying Vs and the SGs and everything that's connected to it. So, you know, we're putting attention across everything that helps us create that amazing Gibson sound. And acoustics is going to be a big part of that. Yeah. I got uh, to change it from acoustic to electric, but I got an RD. Do you remember RDs? Yeah. yeah. It was kind of an experiment. Yeah. I've got one of them. I painted it. Wow. I love you, it. You painted it. Well, I didn't physically. Yeah. Someone yeah, painted it. Yeah. I told well, you them had what it to painted. do. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's a, it's a bizarre bizarre guitar, but it actually plays pretty good. Well, you got to remember, John, like, like, like the Les Paul, the original one, for the first few years was interesting, but they moved off of it. Yeah. And the next Les Paul was actually the SG, you know, they, they, and then the Flying V came out and the Explorer way ahead of its time. That was like in the late fifties, early sixties. And it was like, oh, that's way, that's a space age guitar. Yeah. They, oh, that's too much. And look at it now. Yeah. So, you know, you never know in terms of who's gonna start playing it, the sounds they create, and then people connect with shapes that they love, sounds that they love. and. And your question earlier about what's next, I mean, we got to figure that out. And I think there'll be some exciting new artists who will want to be more involved with the design process, not just the sound, but the design of a guitar. Yeah. I heard uh, today that uh, Jim Dun Dunlop died. Yeah, he uh, uh, yesterday passed away. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, just a legend in the, uh, in the industry and, you know, all that he did and brought to you talk about a guy that shaped and helped shape sound in simple ways, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, another another legend, but you know, it's always tough when when someone moves on from this earth that but but it, what's amazing is they left the body of work. I love the, I something. love them picks. I've yep. always used Yep. Yeah. Them picks. Yeah, so that's that's a tough one. Um are we got to knock it on the head soon. Yeah. We do, right? Um so you're gonna, you going to you had something to say to me about guitar oh oh so yeah uh, the, you know <laughs> Sorry to put you one, on once spot. as soon as uh, it's it's always it, it's it's usually people just sort of oh hey jc oh, oh i got this idea or, i had this guitar or man if i could ever do this or i once had it and it's gone i don't know how to do it so <laughs> we heard we heard that way back in the day that one of your favorite guitars was was a 58 Les Paul, yeah. and it was that um black ebony it was a custom with Alnico five pick. I mean, you described it all to the team, and oh, I gave you all. Oh the no, info. and you you thought the team were just taking notes for yeah. our, for our future book or our history lesson yeah. about you, but uh, they took notes and they took it to the custom shop. And uh, I can tell you, as we speak, the woods being cut, the frets are being put on, and that uh, that black ebony fifty eight Les Paul is going to be coming to you soon i can't promise the date because uh, we're uh, we're working on a whole bunch of stuff but i couldn't be more pleased to say you know th thanks for you for letting us just come and share our story but also um you were you were an amazing part of you know the gibson era and everything you guys brought and you guys were exactly that energy hit at the moment when the world was like what's people were asking what's next you were you guys were what's yeah. next and so pleased to say your uh, your gibson 58 les paul ebony's coming your way 
custom shop, if you're listening, can you make the, the white around the edges a little yellow? Oh, he wants to go there. Make it, look, get, make it look like the original, like a little old. And get that action exactly like. Nicotine around the yeah. wall, you know. There you go. There you go. Yeah, but uh, oh, amazing. So, yeah, we got that coming to you. Well, thanks for coming by, JC. Yeah. And uh, I hope you had fun. I wish you all the best with Gibson. And uh, it's, I mean, do you feel like you've got a big task? I'm sure you're in a plane, you're doing something every 10 minutes. Yeah, it's a task, but it's 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 that cause that's worth it, you know. And I I I, I um I joined knowing that this wasn't just about being a CEO or president. It was about bringing something back to its rightful iconic place. And uh, and I really take, as people know, I I don't take myself too seriously, but I take what I do really seriously. And yeah. and, and this mission, this cause, this this vision to to become again. The most relevant, most played, most loved guitar brand again is is very real for us. The yeah. team wants it, guitarists want it, everyone's behind us. And in the words of your compatriot Joe Cocker, we'll get by with a little help from our friends. Yeah. So we could use a few a uh, few friends along the journey. J.C. Curley, the new president, CEO of Gibson, uh, Jonesy's jukebox. We'll be back uh, Monday at twelve bells. We're going to visit the Duke, and I'll see you later.